Can we get started? Because we have a full um, agenda. We have some people local in the room in Boston here. They'll be joining in. Hopefully people will join as we go. Um, welcome to the first installment of a series of webinars and workshops for the Types of Diabetes Knowledge Portal platform. I'm Noelle Burt. For those of you who don't know me, it's nice to see some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is the first, and the, the, today's goal is really to give you an interactive demonstration of the Knowledge Portal, its tools, functionality, and how you might use it. I'm going to start off with a about 10 minutes of background and motivation and kind of how we came to be and how we're built. Talk a little bit about the data within the Knowledge Portal, and then Maria is going to turn it turn over and do an interactive demo of the tools and how you would actually access these data, um, run queries on them, what tools, what methods, and how you can um, navigate the site. And then finally, Jason Flannick is going to wrap us up with a bit of some future directions and some teasers of what we plan to do in the coming months and year. Um, if you have any questions, we'd love it if you could put them in the chat or email them. If there's any burning questions or you can't hear us, um, please speak up. But um, we want to make sure that we get through the, the, the topics and we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. Um, but our goal is on future webinars, hopefully you'll stick with us and you'll come to those where we'll have deeper dives into the different tools and, and also have opportunity for feedback and exchanges in a more dynamic environment. But today's really an overview. So welcome and thank you and hopefully you can follow along with the slides as we go. So, um, first, what is the Knowledge Portal? I think, very simply put, um, the goal of the Knowledge Portal is to be a software platform and resource um, expressed in a user interface um, that organizes and aggregates human genetics data related and related data and presents them to non-experts. So the goal of it is really to make accessible human genetics data. And why, do, why does this matter? Well. Specifically, it matters, and our motivation comes from the fact that understanding disease biology or developing therapies requires experiments and model systems. And these must be validated in humans, and they must have human relevance. So human genetics is um, experience, experiments of nature, where you can observe variants that perturb the function of a gene in a human system. So that's a natural experiment. To test those, you can perform association studies, where you can take the association between variants and collections of phenotypes and measure the direction, the magnitude, and significance of that effect in a given variant or gene. These association studies have become very prolific and very mature and readily widespread because of two reasons. One, because of our ability in technology development to generate sequence and genotype data, and two, in the maturity of the methods to interrogate this data. And so it's really been sort of a tsunami of data the last 10 years to the point where I believe genetics is a data, a science of data. However, the biggest and most simple challenge is that the disease results are not typically made accessible. And I don't mean accessible necessarily to statistical geneticists, but to people who could actually glean insight to them, to the basic user, to an industry member, to someone who needs them to guide their experiments. So our goal is to minimize that barrier and develop a knowledge portal that can bring these data to you in a, dis in a distilled, accessible, and integrated framework. We're very lucky that this collaboration is catalyzed by a support from a very great partnership that we've been lucky to be part of called Accelerated Medicines Partnership for Type 2 Diabetes. And this is a public-private partnership between the NIH and five pharmaceutical companies. And its goal is simply to use human genetics data to advance new medicines, specifically to generate data uh, for type 2 diabetes and its complications, to make this data accessible, and finally to bring it all together and create a knowledge portal, a platform to make accessible the phenotype and genotype data relevant to diabetes and its complications. What I like best about this activity is I think it marries the best of academia and the best of software development for two reasons. Specifically, it allows the creativity and fluidity um, that comes with an academic partnership, but it also establishes the rigor and the, the, the orientation around prog um, um, product that software development brings. So how are we organized? Well, we have about 27 sites that are geared towards bringing data into the knowledge portal. And we'll talk a bit about that data in a moment. We have a worldwide community that we can leverage. We also have, I would say, the best, <laughs> I'm, not, um, I'm not biased, the best, best sites in the world to bring tools and methods. So these are people who are developing tools for association studies to in interrogate this data, methods to visualize it, um, and to display it. And these tools and methods are all being integrated in the site. Also, you can't have one place in the world 
house all the data in the world, you also need to have federation or basically partner with sister sites who have expertise in different types of disease types or domains. This is federation. And I'll talk about this a little bit in a moment. Then you need a data coordinating center, a warehouse to bring this all together, to organize the data, to organize the analysis, the operations, build the full software stack, and administer the knowledge portal that Maria is going to demonstrate in a moment. So with that, the builders, many of which are in the room on the call today, are across the, across the world actually, and these are software developers, computational biologists, researchers, postdocs, and the experts in the type IBs um, genetics community. So what are the core elements of the portal? There really are five, and they're very simple, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them briefly before I turn over to Maria. The first is community, experts, people who care about a specific disease or phenotype. The second are data need lots of it <laughs> and you need a warehouse together. The third is analysis and the best practices of the community. And, and finally, federation, the one that's got cut off apparently because they macked PC convert, conversion is representation and knowledge delivery. So I'll talk a little bit about first the community. And all this needs to be put together in a, in a flexible and modular software system. So what the most important foundation to me is it takes a motivated research community and really the knowledge portal started based on a set of researchers who all together felt that even within themselves as people producing sequence and genotype data and association studies, they need to make their own data accessible. And so they together brought together many large studies that they were working on independently and said we need to bring these in one framework. They also said we need to bring the best practices, the best tools and the best expression of how we would represent this data publicly available. So I'll talk a little bit about the data that are in the knowledge portal for you, and there's four types of data. The first are data from the diabetes genetics knowledge, I mean, diabetes genetics community. I'll talk a little bit some of the highlights. The highlights are, for example, there are about a million samples um, that you can query, and Maria will show you how to query those, from a genome-wide association study meta-analysis in Europeans called Diamante. There are another 400,000 samples from SNPs in the coding regions of the genome. Also, beyond genotype data, there are whole genomes. So if you want to survey the entire allelic spectrum for types of diabetes, there are 3,000 genomes to do that. And finally, a really amazing data set that just came published, uh, published on the knowledge portal and soon to be at the subject of a publication in Nature are 52,000 whole exomes of types of diabetes that you can query. So that's one type of data set. The other are publicly available data sets. It used to be that you used to have to go to seven or eight sites to find all the publicly available data sets relevant to types of IBs and its complication. You'd have to download these tables, they'd be harmonized in different ways, you'd have to be an expert in aggregating them. But we don't want you to do that any longer. We want to bring them into one place. So for that, we routinely bring together all the major data sets for the genome-wide association studies, including diagram, magic, giant, cardiogram, global lipids, CK, CKGGen, and PGC. These are all routinely updated, even time analysis updated by that various consortium, it's updated in the portal for you. The next is some, some slightly smaller data sets, but the goal of these data sets are funded from the AMP partnership. And these are data sets specifically targeted to have individual level data that you can query. But more importantly, rich phenotypes. They may be smaller, but they're from biobanks that have things like complications data for types of diabetes, rich phenotyping where they're visiting these patients over and over. These are longitudinal studies. They have medication outcomes. These are remarkably rich as you have more deeper queries beyond just diabetes for association. And so these run the gamut of both European and um, multi-ethnic studies. And they also go beyond just traits and phenotypes to metabolite data, which are also upstream and downstream predictors of type 2 diabetes. But then expanding out, another broad category of data in the knowledge portal are disease agnostic resources, and these are two forms. One is very large references. 1,000 Genomes is one of the greatest reference panels that be useful, and then beyond that, NOMAD, which brings together the largest collection of exomes and now genomes in the world, and all the variants associated with within that data set that you can now have in the portal integrated as well beyond just the diabetes. Then looking forward, biobank data. And so there's two current expressions of major biobank data in the portal. The first is the UK biobank where you can query 1400 traits through our partners at the University of Michigan who have analyzed these and represented these balancing for case control of biases. But also there are curated results for diabetes and a host of other traits that coming online and are currently available in some forms on the portal for diabetes and related complications. So 
all these data are in two major broad categories. Summary level statistics, where you can get the, the direction, effect, the allele frequency, all the summary stats that we can get from the various classes of data. Those are all aggregated. But also individual level data that we analyze de novo through our analysis framework and pipeline. So how do we bring all this data together? Well, I'll talk a little bit about the software stack. I'm not going to go into broad detail, but basically there are three entry points for data in just the first level. One is individual level data. This is where you can bring in data in its rawest form, but we have an analysis pipeline called LoamStream that analyzes data straight from the raw BAMs or genotype files all the way to deriving results. This is really important because you want to harmonize data from different sets. So this is an important piece to have, especially if you're getting data all over the world, you want to aggregate it, analyze it in the same fashion. The other way is we want to make sure that data can come from anybody anywhere. So we allow association statistics to come in. These are stored in my, my SQL database and harmonized to all be in the same format and harmonization. So they're represented, not like the way that they might be represented in flat files all over the world. And third, to really leverage both this individual level data and association statistics, you need other omics data for interpretation. So for this, the third piece is bringing in methods that you can run holistically across all these data sets, both the association statistics and the individual level data, and produce results for these data. And these all need to be bundled up and through APIs, they're all represented through our visualization, which is essentially our UI. Maria is going to take you through that. However, no one site can be the data coordinating center. We need to leverage federation. By federation, we mean partnering with other sites who have mirrored versions of either our analysis pipeline or who have expertise in different domains. So the first of these is EBI. EBI was funded to build a sister or a mirror version of what's been built at the DCC to basically be, be able to bring data in that cannot leave Europe. And so at our site, they can collect and aggregate data in the same fashion that we do here at the Broad Institute and represent it on the knowledge portal so that you would not know the difference when you're querying in site. Beyond that, you can also federate for data, other expertise. So for other omics data, we don't want to be the world's expert. We can't be. We have to make sure we federate and bring together the best expertise. So for this, for epigenomic annotations, which were remarkably important for interpretation of human genome, human genetics data we have. We've partnered with the University of um, San Diego, the uh, University of California in San Diego, to build an epigenomic database to represent epigenomic annotations integrated on the portal with the human genetics data. So this is the software platform. What's great about a software platform is that if you want to extend it to other diseases, and if it's modular and flexible, if you have the same data types, you can extend it to other disease communities. So we've been very lucky to partner with other disease communities, and we're not going to tour those portals today, but we built the exact same framework for these other disease communities. And what's important about that? Well, what's important is that these can be, that this platform can be extended to other diseases. And why does that matter? Well, there's some common themes, and which, is, which is really powerful. These common themes are that there's a community that has expertise in the disease and cares about understanding biology from human genetics. They have the same mission. They care about bringing data, making data publicly available. They have the accessibility to the results, and they have a high volume of data that they, they themselves need to bring together. They have domain expertise. They're the expert in the trait or the phenotype or the, the method that they need. But more importantly, what's been very valuable for us as we've embarked on the diabetes portal and now these four others is that they desire customization. And if you look at all four of these sites, and and Maria will show you, you can navigate to all of them, but all of these sites are linked from each other's sites. So if you go to the diabetes portal, you can get to the other ones as well. Um, what's unique is that each of them have brought to us new features and new customization because they have different ways where they like to represent their results or their features. And that's been really remarkable for us as we've expanded the platform. So we have other development areas. We're not going to talk about that today. We're not going to tour the other sites. But what we've done, because we've expanded beyond our first four portals, we're all in the cardiometabolic space with the cerebrovascular, cardiovascular disease, and the sleep disorders portal. And those are all available on each of the home pages of those respective portals. But when we branched into ALS, we branched to a totally different disease space um, where we branched into the neurodegenerative space. So we've created a website which is an, a partner website to our knowledge portal where you can go to to get to any of the sites at any time. But it's important to remember all of these are built in the same warehouse, the same data platform, the same representation. So without that, with, with the journal, we'll pass it up to Maria is going to give you a tour of the knowledge portal using the diabetes as the center, um, center framework. Okay, thanks Noel. This is Maria Costanzo. 
Um, okay, and just a reminder, if, in case you'd like to follow along during this, um, you will need a Google login or a Google account that's managed by an institution just to get to the portals. That's just how they're built. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is just kind of a, a whirlwind tour, a very high-level overview of the knowledge portal architecture. And as Noelle said, I will talk mostly about the, the T2D portal, but basically everything I say is applicable to the other portals as well. And if you know how to navigate the one, you can navigate them all. So I'll um, talk briefly about three major entry points to the results. Why would you want to get into the portals? Well, you might want to, you might be interested in a disease or a trait, and you might want to explore the genetic landscape for that trait. So you might want to see associations across the genome. And you can do that with our interactive Manhattan plot. Um, you might come in with some prior knowledge about a gene or a region or a variant of interest, maybe a, a model organism result that's intriguing or, or just some wet lab uh, results on a chain of interest. So um, you can also go into the portal and find information specific to a genomic region. Um, and finally, you can also um, use our variant finder tool to retrieve um, sets of variants meeting custom criteria. Maybe you're interested to see if there are any variants that um, influence uh, both T2D and um, BMI or T2D and cardiovascular disease, for example. So I'll show you how to do that. Um, I'll give you a very quick um, tour of um, one of our interactive tools, the custom burden test. Um, and then I'll just briefly touch on a couple of, of really um, interesting new things in our March release, which just happened last week. Okay, so entry point number one, you, you're interested in some trait and you want to see what, what are the genetic results for it. So to do this, you would start at the home page and then this, this new um, link analysis modules um, takes you to a new page that we've made that gathers um, all the tools that we have right? and we'll be adding more tools to this um, in the future. So that's where you get to the interactive Manhattan plot. And on this page, you can select a phenotype and launch the plot. And let me show you a little bit about how to select the phenotype. So um, if, you, if you click on the phenotype box, um, you'll see a list of phenotypes. And it's getting very long at this point. We have over 160. So you could scroll through it to find the one you want. But a probably better approach is to start typing in the box. And once you start typing, as, as shown in the last box there, um, you'll get the, the phenotype names that match that text string. And then you can select one. So when you do that and launch the plot, um, you'll get to a page like this. And the, I've, the plot is on the top, um, and there's a table underneath it. So this plot you're probably all familiar with, but it shows chromosomal, chromosome and chromosomal position across the horizontal axis and significance of association on the vertical axis. So each of these points is a variant um, and its associations. So the plot, the plot is on the top, and then um, just below the plot is a list of the um, the variants and their p-values and other information about them. <coughs> so you can interact with this plot in several ways. Um, first of all, if you want to um, look at a different phenotype, you, there's a phenotype selection box here where you can also go between phenotypes. Um, you can also choose a data set if there's more than one data set in the, the portal that has data for this phenotype. Um, by default, the largest data set for that phenotype is shown, but you can choose another one. And they're, they're ordered in order of decreasing sample size. Um, oh yeah, I meant to say that um, when you mouse over the points in the plot, you will see information about that variant. And if you click on it, it will take you to its variant page, which I'll explain in a couple of minutes. Um, and then finally, um, we've added something relatively relatively recently, the ability to clump these plots by LD, or linkage, linkage disequilibrium. Um, and you can choose different R-squared thresholds. So the idea here is that um, large blocks of the genome are inherited, always inherited together. And if there may be many significant variants within one of these blocks, um, but they're they're redundant in a sense that they're all pointing, they're all representing the same signal. So LD clumping is a way to reduce the complexity and the redundancy of this plot. And, and here's an example. Um, the, on the left is a plot that's not clumped. On the right is a plot that's clumped at our most stringent threshold. So even at this level of resolution, you can see the plots look different. And um, more informative is the table of, of hits. So you can, um, well, you may not be able to read this, but on the left, with no clumping, the top 25 hits, and actually the next few hundred hits, I think, are all in one gene. But when you clump within the top 25 hits, you see 11 different genes. So it's definitely reducing the complexity. Okay, let's go on to entry point number two. Suppose you come in interested in a particular gene. So to do this, you use the explore data um, entry box, which is on, on the home page. 
you can start typing a G name and you'll be presented with um, autocomplete options and you can choose one. So this is the top of the gene page and it's really a pretty complicated page and I'm, I'm going to go over it in some depth but I don't have time to do everything so um, a future webinar is going to go into the, the gene page in, in uh, complete detail. Okay, so first thing to remember is that the gene page um, integrates information not only across the coding sequence, but also across 100 and KB, 100 KB upstream and downstream. And this is because um, it's it's in most cases it's really difficult to link a GWAS signal um, specifically to a gene. A, a GWAS signal in one gene could actually affect a gene in outside that gene. So so we we, we want to um, extend the range to give you the full the full picture here. So at the top of the gene page is a traffic light, and this whoops sorry. Um, the traffic light integrates the results of an algorithm that looks across all of the associations and all the data sets that are, that are in this portal. So, um, and the traffic light stays constant no matter what you do to the rest of the page, as I'll show you later. Um, so it just summarizes the evidence for associations in this region. A green light means there's strong evidence for an association of at least one phenotype in this region. Yellow light means suggestive evidence. The red light means no evidence for associations in the data sets and phenotypes in this portal. So it doesn't mean there are no associations with anything, but for the, this disease specific collection, we don't see any association. Right below this, se this section is um, a section that we, are, we call the phenotype bubbles. Um, and there, the phenotypes are listed here and the color coding is the same. So the green phenotypes are those for which there's a significant association and so forth. When you click on one of these bubbles, you change the whole rest of the, the page below it. So that's that's important to know that it doesn't change the traffic light, but it changes everything else you will see on the gene page. And um, by default in the T2D portal, type, type 2 diabetes is the trait that's shown. So below the phenotype bubbles, you can see the, the bottom of that section here, um, is you can see there are three tabs on the gene page, and I'm gonna briefly touch on each of them. So these tabs will, will change depending on the phenotype that you choose. Um, the top variance tab just shows all of the most significant variants and they're listed in a table that's much longer than this, it's scrollable. Um, it's an interactive table and I won't demonstrate all that, but all of the columns can be sorted. You can also choose a particular data set to view if you want and you can modify the columns of the table. To, you can display different, different columns if you want to. Um, just below that table, on, on the top variance tab, is a locus zoom display. I want to spend a little time on this because this is a, a very um, cool tool. I think you probably are all familiar with this too because it's widely used in the genetics community. It was um, created by our colleagues at University of Michigan. And the locus zoom plot displays associations across the region. So on the gene page, by default, it's set to that, um, the gene area, the gene plus or minus 100 KB that I, that I told you about. Um, and the, the vertical axis is p-value, and the, the points are variants, and if you mouse on a variant, you can see more information about it, and also get links to do some more things with it that I'm not going to be able to cover right now. For the locus zoom plot as a whole, um, you can shift and scroll to zoom in or out of this region, and you can also click and drag the plot to pan across vertically, I mean, sort of horizontally. Um, the display below that plot shows chromatin states in the region. Chromatin states are um, predictions about the regulatory potential of an area of DNA, and they're based on epigenomic modifications like um, histone modifications, DNA methylation, that kind of thing. Um, and I'm also going to go into more detail about that in a minute. Okay, for the locus zoom plot, you can add multiple plots to display multiple phenotypes if you want. So. Uh, just above the plot, there is a selection for phenotype, and it's the same kind of a list, and you can start typing in it to filter those phenotypes and find the one you want. Once you select a phenotype, then uh, the data set selection will show you all of the data sets that are available for that phenotype. And I just want to point out that some of these are marked static and some are marked dynamic. So the ones that are static are based on summary stats. Um, and the ones that are marked dynamic are based on individual level data, and that means you can do more with them. You can do a custom association analysis within LocusZoom. I'm not have, gonna have time to demonstrate that. Um, okay, so let's delve into the epigenomic details. Um, here's just a close up of um, the, uh, the epigenomic display, and um, it's a little hard to interpret this when all the colors are collapsed, but if you click on split tracks, you can split them up and now you can see the individual 
um, regions that are marked as um, enhancers, for example, or strong transcription. Or there are about, I think, 13 chromatin states that are that we have at the moment. So that's a good way to look at them. And then for some of these tissues, there are also attack seq reads available. So those um, are indications of open chromatin, which also um, indicates regulatory potential. So you can you can open that up and see it. And then just to put this all together, um, these these plots are stacked up on top of each other. And when you mouse over, you can get a crosshair. So you can easily see whether a variant of interest is lined up with an attack seq peak and which chromatin state it also lines up with. And of course, if a variant is in an attack seq peak and in an enhancer in a particular tissue of interest, like pancreatic islets for diabetes, that, that's a good indication that you might want to look further into it. Um, okay, and so you can also select multiple tissues. We've, for each portal, we've um, picked some tissues to show by default that are um, most relevant to that disease, but there are many tissues, and you can pick more and add those tracks to the display. Okay, let's move on to the high impact variants tab on the gene page. Um, this um, tab is meant to collect the variants that affect a coding sequence. And just as a reminder, they're not all um, in the gene of the page because there are multiple genes in this region. So, but there is a gene column that tells you exactly where this coding variant is. Um, the table has the same kind of interactive features. And then right below the table, we've pre-computed some aggregate burden tests for this, this region. Um, and the four boxes here represent four different categories of variants categorized by, categorized by their impact. So for example, PTV is the protein truncating variants. And if you click on the question mark by each of these, you'll get an explanation of what, what these names mean. Um, so this gives you an idea of the aggregate um, disease burden of, of the gene. Um, I'll point out this link here, run a custom burden test. That's the interactive tool that I'm going to talk about in a couple minutes. Okay, on to the credible sets tab of the gene page. So credible sets are um, sets of variants that are predicted to contain a causal variant for, for a particular phenotype. And um, they're, they're really useful to um, zero in on the, the variant that is most likely to be causal. And so for type 2 diabetes, we have credible sets that were, um, were uh, created by in, in Mark McCarthy's group at Oxford, and so they're they're really well well curated credible sets. Um, type two diabetes right now is the only phenotype for which we have these credible sets, but Locus Zoom has a module that will calculate credible sets. So for any other phenotype, you can now see calculated credible sets on this tab, and they can be very useful too. The top of the credible sets tab um, is a um, a table showing. Um, each variant in the set, and it indicates whether they overlap with coding sequences, for example, or splice sites, UTRs. It also shows their posterior probability and their, their p-value. And then the color, uh, colored bars here indicate whether they overlap with a particular chromatin state. So for example, here, the, the variant with the highest posterior probability and um, also the most significant p-value overlaps with, with an enhancer, although it's actually in leukemia cells, which is a little odd. but uh, that's that's what the data say. Um, okay, and below that table is another locus zoom plot. But in this case, the vertical axis is not p-value, but but posterior probability. So you can see here really easily that this this variant is stands out from the rest as being the most likely to be causal. Okay, um, so. Suppose you don't have a particular, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say that if you have a genomic region in mind, you can put in the coordinates and you'll get a page that's very much like the gene page. Um, so it'll integrate information across that region the same way that the gene page does. And that's useful if, um, for example, you're interested in looking at a non-coding region and see, seeing what's there. Okay, um, finally, if you are interested in a particular variant, you can also enter it in the search box in the same way and get to a variant page. And I'm, I'm not going to cover the whole variant page, but I'll just um, point out a few things of interest on it. So at the top, um, there's just a summary of what the variant is, what the, what the it's being the most likely to be causal. Okay, um, so suppose you don't have a particular, oh, I, I'm sorry, I meant to say that if you have a genomic region in mind, you can put in the coordinates and you'll get a page that's very much like the gene page. Um, so it'll integrate information across that region the same way that the gene page does. And that's useful if, um, for example, you're interested in looking at a non-coding region and see, seeing what's there. 
Okay, um, finally, if you are interested in a particular variant, you can also enter it in the search box in the same way and get to a variant page. And I'm, I'm not going to cover the whole variant page, but I'll just um, point out a few things of interest on it. So at the top, um, there's just a summary of what the variant is, what the, what the alleles are, and uh, the transcripts in which it's located. And then um, immediately below that is a section, Associations at a Glance, that gives you a great overview of what's going on with this variant. Um, you may have come to it because it's associated with type 2 diabetes, but it could um, be associated with a bunch of other phenotypes, and this is a quick way to find that out. So at the, there's a FIWAS plot, um, again, a locus zoom module, um, and we are showing now four different types of the data in it, so I'm going to go over those briefly. So the default value that C shows the lowest p-value. It's the single most significant p-value for this variant in the data sets that we have in the portal. So um, going across the bottom are phenotypes, and they're color-coded by phenotype categories, such as glycemic phenotypes. Um, the vertical axis is p-value, and um, so um, if you click on a point, you can see, for example, that this variant is associated with, uh, with this phenotype, and it gives more details about which data set and so forth. So it's a good way to see quickly, for example, that this variant is also associated with, with fasting glucose. Um, the next selection for data here is, um, is, is very new, uh, bottom line analysis. So this is um, the application of a method that um, was developed by our colleagues at University of Michigan. And it's a meta-analysis across all of the data in the portal. But not only that, it takes into account sam sample overlap between the data sets. So that's, that's really um, something new. And many of these data sets have extensive overlap, so it's it's not you know you can't just legitimately add up everything you see. You have to take overlap into account, and so this new algorithm does. Um, it's still in, in beta version, but we hope you'll check it out and, and let us know what you think. It's going to be really useful. Um, the, the third choice here is just to see all data sets. If you want to see everything we have in the portal, each of these um, points uh, gives a phenot gives an association of this variant in one particular data set. And then finally, um, a um, UK biobank analysis that, that Noel mentioned. This was done by our colleagues at University of Michigan. And um, you can see there are many more phenotypes going across the, the bottom here. Um, and so there are many phenotypes that we don't have in the portal. I mean, things like injuries and poisonings um, and, and other, other types of, of um, disease and trait. So this is a, a great way to see if this variant has any you know, far-flung associations that, that wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred to us. In the same section, um, the same basic information is shown in a forest plot. And this is a kind of plot that's um, maybe more familiar to, to many geneticists. A lot of people like to look at this. Um, it's a little hard to see in this diagram, but the color coding shows the significant of, significance of associations. So the most significant associations are down here at the bottom. These are phenotypes. I'm sure you can't read them. But this plot, um, in addition, it, it, differently from FIWAS, it also shows the direction of effect and the magnitude of effect. So that's, that's a useful way to look at these things. Okay, uh, entry point number three. You might want to come in looking for variants that affect um, certain phenotypes in certain ways, and the way to do this is the variant finder. So again, we'll start on the home page and go to the analysis modules page, and the variant finder is right there. And so um, to use this tool, you first of all pick a phenotype. So we'll choose type 2 diabetes, and then once you choose a phenotype, you're presented with the data sets that have information for that phenotype. So we'll pick another data set, a data set here. And then um, once you pick a data set, you are presented with parameters that you can set to, to pick, um, to collect variants from this data set. Um, so here I've put in a, a, a p-value, uh, less than 5 times 10 to the minus 6, and an odds ratio less than 1, so I'm looking for variants that are protective for type 2 diabetes. Um, you don't have to fill in all these parameters, just one of them will, will give you results. Um, and once you're done, you click Add Criteria, and then you'll see which criteria you've added. They're listed here. And you can go on from here to submit a search, but then if you want to add more criteria, you can also do that. So I've just repeated the same procedure here to um, look for variants that are um, associated with coronary artery disease and that are protective for coronary artery disease. So now we'll click Submit Search Request, and when you do that, it gives you all variants that, are, um, that answer all of these criteria. 
Okay, and so there are actually 44 variants that, that answer all these criteria. And um, this table is also very interactive. You can add more data sets, more phenotypes. I'm not going to show you that, but we do have a pretty detailed results table guide that will, will help you um, work with that if you want to. So, so this is, um, you can, you know, the, there are many phenotypes and you can look for their intersections with this tool. It's a really uh, great way to, to pull out variants um, from data sets. Okay, um, very quickly I want to go over the custom burden test because this is an, um, an interactive tool that we have that lets you actually access individual level data, not access it, but work with individual level data. You can run a custom association analysis while the individual level data is secure and never directly seen by, by you. So that's, that's really, it's, it's an unusual tool and, and really cool. Um, to start with this, um, the first step, oh, this, is, this is how the tool looks when you get there. You can choose different phenotypes and you can stratify by ancestry, filter cases and control separately if you want to. The first major step is to manage your variant selection. So you're setting up here to do a custom um, aggregation burden test across this gene. So first of all, you can pick your variants and you can select variants by their, um, their predicted impact on the protein. Um, you can also set uh, minor allele frequencies if you want to, and you can also tweak this list of variants by um, selecting and deselecting individual variants, and you can also add variants to the list, so it's totally customizable. The next step is to filter the samples, and this is also um, totally customizable. So when you first go to this, uh, this page, you see a graph that shows the distribution of, um, here in this case it's age, across all these samples. So there's um, 42,000 samples we're looking at, and this is the distribution. When you click in any one of these boxes next to a phenotype, you'll see the distribution for that, that parameter, and then you can set them. So for example, here I've, I've put age less than 50 and BMI under 30. Maybe you want to look at type 2 diabetes in, um, in relatively young and lean people. Um, so when you do that, it, um, the samples are filtered to give you just that subset. And now you can run the analysis using that subset. The final step is to select covariates. And we have some PCs um, selected by default, but you can also select more PCs and you can choose a phenotype to test whether phenotypes are independent. And finally, you launch the analysis and you'll, you'll get an output something like this where it will tell you um, a p-value for association with, with your phenotype. So there's a lot more to, to know about this tool, but um, that that's just gives you an idea, I think, of, of what it can do. Okay, um, finally, I wanted to mention a couple things that are new and notable in our March release. Um, and as Noel alluded to, um, we have a, a major new data set, AMP Genes Exome Sequence Analysis. So it's, it's over 50,000 exome sequences from multiple ancestries. And um, one new thing about it relative to the other data in the portal is that it has gene level association scores as well as variant level associations. Uh, and right now these are, are for the T2D phenotype, but other phenotypes will be analyzed in the future. So the way to see these gene level association scores is um, in this section of the home page right here, view genetic association results. You can click the radio button to view gene associations and go to that page. And then you have a table um, showing these gene level association scores. And the table is interactive. So there's a, there are lots of ways to filter it here. You can filter it by seven different groupings of variants that uh, look at their predicted impact by, by various methods. Um, there are also two different aggregation tests available that summarize these results. So we, we recommend that the, for the, the basic um, view, you should take a look at the extreme p-value aggregation test, which just gives you the most significant um, p-values for each. <coughs> so this is, this is something new for the portal, and it's, um, it's uh, nice to have you know, gene level scores instead of only variant level scores. Um, and then just quickly, one other new thing is that we're, we're getting into video. We, we, um, we realize that videos are really helpful for a lot of people to, to learn how to use tools, and we want to make a, a whole set of brief videos that, that teach you how to use these tools. So we made our first one, with thanks to Ali, who did the, the majority of the work, and it's on YouTube, and um, it's just a brief introduction and walkthrough to the portal, but we're planning to add many more of these. And you can get to this video this is the top menu bar of the, of the portal, and there's a resources tab.
tab, and that has not only this video, but also lots of, of uh, PDF guides to the various tools. Um, this is our wonderful team who are responsible for everything I've just talked about. And that's about all I had to say, and I think Jason can take over. We're getting questions after, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll just briefly cover in the next um, five minutes or so three um, some of the directions we're planning on in the next year for taking the, the portal with a uh, heavy focus obviously on the diabetes portal. Maria covered uh, some of the features that we have currently for prioritizing variants via the Credible Sets tab on the portal. Um, this is just another screenshot of that. and. Um, we originally intended this um, as a means to look at variants in Incredible Set and then annotate them with simple epigenomic annotations. But a big effort that we're going to be undertaking in the next year, um, in conjunction with a lot of our MT2D colleagues, is to expand this significantly into a more general UI for prioritizing variants and also prioritizing genes. So the idea is to have many more types of predictors that could predict causal variants or effector genes um, than just epigenomic data um, to work with our colleagues at UCSD to bring that in and represent it um, in a way that the portal can handle and then to have a new visualization that's much more general and can display summary information of those predictors as well as um, drill downs into the raw data. Um, as part of that, we're going, to de we're going to be deploying that not only in the in the gene or region page to help examine evidence um, for variants in genes near GWAS locus, but also uh, to start trying to regularly update, um, yeah, I'm actually not sure of the name yet, but something like predicted um, diabetes candidate gene lists that will be done by the MTC project and then um, shown on the portal um, with the evidence in favor of those genes as that evolves. So that's going to be the big focus of our work in large part because there's a lot of efforts um, to gather data and to design algorithms to predict these genes and variants um, and it's a priority area not just for MTC but many other um, pe uh, people working in the complex disease space. Um, another big focus will be to take um, the portals that are currently um, distinct um, that, that Maria and Noel have alluded to and to make it so you don't need to go to four different sites to see all of the phenotypes across them but to have a single portal whereby you can go and see all of the data across these sites. Um, that will expand the number of phenotypes significantly beyond what we have in any one portal today and as uh, Maria mentioned um, we're already you know, kind of struggling with the appropriate ways to organize and visualize the data in the portals that we have. So there will be um, significant work to try to make that portal more coherent in terms of the data that's displayed and also some engineering work to make it more performant and um, efficiently able to serve all of the data that we expect. And then finally, just, um, I mean, those are, I think are the two major areas. There are a couple of um, ongoing work that won't be new, but will we'll continue. Obviously, we'll continue to update all of the associations that are available through the portal. We're going to heavily focus on complication data for type 2 diabetes in the next year, so cardiovascular um, data sets beyond what we can, what we currently have in the CVD portal, um, obesity data, kidney data, where we can get that. Um, that'll be a big focus. Um, the exome sequence data set that Maria alluded to will be expanded with not just T2D associations, but um, analyses with other quantitative traits. There's uh, you know upwards of 35,000 people for many cardiometabolic traits, and so those will all be analyzed and put up on the portal as soon as those become available. Um, we'll also, as um, you know, planning to analyze the UK Biobank exomes in a similar way, and that data will be made available on the portal as soon as we can. Um, and then there will be a big just under the hood undertaking to significantly improve um, kind of the architecture of the portal to make it so uh, the response time for queries and also the way information is organized is just um, just improved as to relative to where it is today. You probably noticed that the load times of pages <coughs> have gotten longer over as we've added more functionality and the information has you know become a little more dense. So we're going to streamline that both in terms of how the information is showed and also um, in terms of the code that's serving it such that pages can come back much faster and more responsibly. So that's just a quick overview of I think the main directions. I'm not sure if I missed anything that you want to talk about as well. Um, but if not, I guess we have time for questions or not, but I'll turn it back to you. Jason, um, we actually
she had some questions online as we went, and it was really cool because one of the developers of Locusum answered it, which was pretty awesome. So thank you for being on, our Michigan colleagues. That was pretty cool. Um, we want to open up the floor for any questions. Are there gene level association scores by data set? So I'm, I'm assuming the question refers to gene level association scores for the exomes data set, which is what we have available now. That's brand new functionality we released in um, in uh, just this last Friday. So there's only gene level associations for that one data set. So I guess, but kind of trivially, the answer would be yes. Um, and what we are, we actually are planning in the in the in the next week or so to release um, significantly expanded gene level associations calculated from GWAS data sets. They'll be in conjunction with um, Michigan and uh, Vanderbilt, Nancy Cox and Mike Benke, where they have this method MetaX scan, which, can, which tries to summarize EQTL information into a gene level score. And that will be available not by data set, but by phenotype. If you want it within the existing 50K data set, if you want it to by sub cohort set by entity. That we don't have. Yeah, so we only have it across the full. I mean, you can um, analyze by ancestry interactively with TTE, but not at the level of cohort. And you can't do like genome wide. Like, you could put that up if that's of interest to see. But there's a great other question. Are there documents on how computations are done? Hopefully, I answered this question correctly. There's two com computations I'm, I'm hoping that you're, you're asking for. One is our analyses for our association analyses. The answer is for anything that we uh, have analyzed from individual level data on the knowledge portal, we document all the materials and methods for that. Um, you can find that per data set on the data page. So you go to the data page, go to the data set you're interested in, scroll down. You'll first see any relevant publications, but then you'll see how the data were assembled and the origin, but then you'll see two PDFs. One is all the QC, sample and, 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 and variant level QC, and then an uh, analysis one, which has all the tests that were run on the data sets, and that's one way to drill down. The other thing are the methods, which you might be asking. So that comes in two flavors. For that, if it's a method that's encapsulated in software, we have GitHub repos for those. We also have some documentation for Locusum. It has an independent place. And I think those, those links are located on the portal in some level, but not completely. So that's one thing we are planning to add to. Um, so documentation for how bottom line is calculated, for example, we're going to be added. If you mouse over some of the question marks, that's where you get some description. But we will be adding deeper documentation for methods as we go forward. I'm hoping that answers your question, Jason. Anything to add on that? No. Do you have plan to add API access to the variant finder? That's a great question, Jason. You want to fill that one? So, so um, I actually, I should probably have checked this before, but I believe we already have API access that's been publicly available for the data sets that we have for mission, right? This was done as part for of the ones that are globally available. Yeah, so right. we should actually find out what the URL for that is. So, um, so, so to back up, so there's not an API for the variant finder per se, but there's an even more, there's a more flexible REST API that implements it that allows you to essentially search across all the GWAS statistics that we have using a combination of filters. I believe it's flexible enough to do OR filters as well as AND filters, I believe. Um, so the issue is that all of the data in the portal can't yet be made available through that API. So what we've done thus far is to make a version of that that serves all the public data sets that are redistributable, and that's available already. And we should get that link and share it. Um, there, we are actually considering um, in the next couple months extending the, the, you know, having that API be available for all data sets with some um, once you can author what you know with some mechanism for authorizing user access. And that's something that will be coming in the next couple months. But we should definitely get you know since we should publicize that URL that we made um, more since I think it could be valuable. Next question, these are great questions, thank you. How do you cite your site and the data sets and publications using your site? Great question. Maria, do you want to field that one? Yes, so um, there's um, some information about that on our at the bottom of our homepage and also on our um, policies page. Um, we don't yet have a publication for the portal, although we're working on that. Um, but um, we, when we do, we'll put that reference up. So anyway, um, if you can just cite the portal itself in, in the format that's shown on on our homepage, and also if you cite, if you are working with a particular data set, please do cite the paper from which that data set came, the, the original source of the data. Yes, yeah, so on the homepage there is actually a uh, template for citation. Yes, there is. Yeah, so that would help. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but it sounds good. 
any other questions? We got any fee, any feature requests too, or any feedback would also be nice to hear if people have that in addition to questions. Uh, my my question is, and apologies if I missed this, but uh, is it possible to um, to do bulk queries? So if I have a list of uh, five hundred genes or hundred genes. Uh, that I can input these in book form and output data in book form. So that's a great question. That's a feature that we've gotten a lot yeah. from um, our pharmaceutical colleagues. And um, I, I, so not through the portal currently, although this is something that we um, could add and we've considered adding through the REST API that if we can get the link for that, that would enable you to do um, to do queries in a bulk way in that manner. The issue is that we don't actually currently have a gene level summary of information currently that can be calculated quickly. So once we have that implemented, which is something we're hoping to make more progress on in the next several months, I think we could add a user interface whereby someone could type in genes and get things back. For variants, you know, we could do that today, but I think there's been less interest in variant bulk searches. There's also the constraint about data downloads, right? So there has to be an upper yeah. limit. As to, you, you can't put the 22,000 genes in the genome and get a response yeah. about 22,000. Yeah. That. Well, so I, yeah. So some of these studies don't allow downloading of all of the data. So I, you know, you wouldn't want to. You would have to put some restrictions on. But I think most of the. I think the use case that uh, it's bringing up is that you'll often do a screen and you right. get like the hundred top hits and you just want to see. So. That's that's something that we actually got a long we got a very early stage from our our collaborators and just have it have the uh, data yet even to implement that but hopefully in the coming months we'll be able to do that. Okay, thank you very much. I guess in the meantime we can just contact one of you guys. For, yes, uh, that would be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like you know, absolutely. But yeah, we should elevate that priority again because it is something. Right. We've got. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. James, James, you ask a great question. Um, are there any examples of a research paper that has relied exclusively on the portal for analysis? This is a great question and something we've always hoped for. The answer is no, but yes. Maria's going to say yes, but I wouldn't say not quite yet. I would say close. What would you yeah, say? no, I'm not sure if you're definition of exclusively but, exclusively, but there are something like 60 papers now that are citing the portal, and a lot of them have used the portal for application. Yeah, I think the, the, the Luke Camp one where they actually that, what was that new Modi? What was the gene that came out in Nature Genetics from Lou Camp? It was like a new Modi gene, or uh, I can't remember what it was. But they actually ran like the gate tool to check for loss of function variants for it. Um, but yeah, there was. It's, I think mostly replication data. I, we should probably say we would not advise using the portal solely for um, a research paper at this point. That would probably be potentially error prone and should. We should, you should probably contact us if that is your sole source of data. But for replication, um, we have seen some successes, Maria. Said. And also for for uh, exploration in the human context, yeah, uh, that confirms experimental yes. findings in model systems. So there are papers that Correct. have gone to portal data and have used that to support uh, biological hypothesis based model systems, which we know from the editor had an impact on the paper getting accepted in the higher impact journal. That's interesting. Yeah, so uh, you're right. So beyond, in addition to replication, like um, validation of some functional or experimental, yeah, yeah, those would be, I think, where it's had the most success. But sole source, that that is that, that would be a difficult part <laughs> to clear. What other questions do folks have or feedback? These have been great questions. So we've recorded other languages. what? Other languages. Other languages. We used to have one in Spanish, but we have not been as 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 diligent in keeping that up over time. Uh, that actually is a good question and been challenging to do. We would like to uh, find ways to do that again. It's a great question. You do have global use, actually. Good point. <clears throat> also, if you're interested in, um, you know, one of the things that was really important to us is building the platform out for other disease areas. As I mentioned, there are four other disease areas that um, are in, in in early stages of development. One is a, a musculoskeletal one, a COPD portal. We're also working with a group to develop a lipid droplet um, 
biology portal. Um, there's also interest in something at the road, which is bringing us from variant to function. So there's other areas where we are developing portals, but we really also would love to partner with you if you have interesting data sets, interesting methods, interesting tools, things that you'd like to see published. Please, um, we only get better by the feedback that we get, to be honest. So it's, I'm really appreciative of you all being here today and giving us some feedback and giving us your time. Any other questions? All right. Well, we're going to end a little early, which is great, which means you have some time back. That means we actually kept the time, which is awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, and if you want to join, um, make sure you get on our user mailing list. After this call, Maria will send out the mailing list to be part of. If you want to have a yeah, there's, on our home page, there is a link. Uh, the, the email link will let you sign up for occasional emails from us. So you're welcome to do that, or just contact me directly, too. Lovely. Thank you for your time, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Take care.